You are listening to Fantasy Film Ball with Matt and Dylan, and on this show, we turn movies into sports and look at all the Oscar prospects and their fantasy value. I believe that this is going to win Best Picture, and here's why. I mean, Denis Villeneuve got all the nominations he needed for Dune and still missed out on the Best Director slot. Don't let me get my hopes up. The Academy has disappointed me too many times. Thank you to the Academy. Thank you to all of you in this room. I can't remember the last time I walked out of a movie theater in such a high. No matter how certain it seems, anything can happen on nominations morning. Never count the Golden Globes for just doing something off the walls and bonkers. It's the kind of movie that reminds me of why I fell in love with movies. And the Oscar goes to... Welcome into episode 9 of Fantasy Filmball. My name's Dill. And my name's Matt, and this is a show where we turn movies into sports, and sports into something that we don't talk about here. And today, we have a great episode, because we're going to be starting to jump into the game. Now, the game, the game is why we're here right now. Fantasy Film Ball, it's a game we've been playing for a few years, and we're expanding and expanding. And if you want to play, you can join our Discord, which is just in our description of both the Spotify, Apple Music, really wherever you're listening to the, the podcast. So uh, you can join our Discord and join our Fantasy Film Ball League. Now today we're going to be giving you some tips and tricks of maybe how to win this year because the draft for the game is going to be coming up the end of August. So listen close because this episode might give you some uh, handy things to come out on top this year. But our question of the week, as always, we always start with the question of the week. Best film ball picks of the past Now, this in line with what our episode is, we're going to talk about some of our best uh, choices that we've made in previous years of film ball, things that have really pushed us uh, to some great points. So, Dill, why don't you start? Uh, What's been your best film ball pick of the past? So, the first year I played was the 2020 year, as like everyone knows, that was a very unconventional Oscar season, and that was the year that y'all decided to introduce waivers, where you could pick up films after the draft because of how much movement was happening. Because like, I thought the team I drafted was pretty solid, but I also had a fair share of movies that did flee the season because of delays. Um, and we had the waiver priority, and one I passed up on because I wasn't really sure how it worked was Borat, which turned out to be a major player. So like, I was really jealous when I was able to get that. But the next time waivers came around, Sound of Metal was out there. I was like, you know what? I want a waiver movie. I don't really know much about this, but I've heard some good things. So why not just go all in? And I think I got it for only like a hundred or like 120 points, and it ended up yeah. being one of like the top 10 scores of the year. Yeah, that was wild because no one picked Sound of Metal in the initial draft. And so the way the game works, we'll keep explaining it more and more, and we'll talk about. You'll get very familiar with how the game works out there. But essentially, we draft 60 movies in August. Uh, So every single player in a league of six uh, gets 10 movies for themselves. And so that means that there's a lot of movies that are left out there. A lot of international films, a lot of documentaries, um, and some big films that we miss. Like in 2018, uh, which was the actual first year we played the game, um, no one picked Green Book. So in the past few years, we've introduced a rule where every month we get back together and we pick some uh, some films and add to the team afterwards. So, Dill, you got Sound of Metal super late uh, because no one thought Sound of Metal was going to be a big thing until, like, what, December? Yeah, I think I got it on whatever was the first waiver day that we did because I remember Borat was, like, the first movie that we, we uh, like picked and then it was uh, Pieces of a Woman and both of those went for pretty high points. So I was like, you know what? I can slide in here and maybe get this for a little cheaper because like, I wanted something. Borat, like I said, was like the one I wanted most, but I wasn't really sure how the waivers worked. So I sat back, I saw how the bidding war happened and then took advantage after people got the quote, quote, bigger movies and got one that beat them both out for a Best Picture nomination. Now for me, uh, a couple of my best ones that I've ever gotten uh, were ones that were not Best Picture nominees. I've had my fair share of Best Picture nominees but, you know, you expect to get those. You get those first, second round picks that they are your ringers. They're the films that you expect to be big, and then they are big. But a couple films that I got in the very last round, like in the final tenth round of picking, I got Can You Ever Forgive Me and The Two Popes, both of which were films that 
Because in, in the 10th round, there's so little left that you're really lucky to get anything that scores above 100 points. So getting Can You Ever Forgive Me, The Two Popes, two films that everyone else in the league kind of just thought, hmm, those are going nowhere. And snagging those and getting, you know, having enough faith in those films that they're going to get something. And then they both end up getting 500 to 600 points. That really works out. I keep saying points. We're going to explain this whole system later. So, uh, but basically points are a combination of, uh, you get points for awards, nominations, and wins. You get it for Metacritic score, and you get it for box office and a few other things here and there. Exactly, but for our next segment, we're gonna talk about some movies that have trailers come out this week that could equate to some pretty good points depending on how they play in this fall season with some festival premieres and also some movies that are just coming straight to theaters. And look at this list that we have here. Which one stood out the most to you? Ooh, I mean, for me, Banshee's trailer was just one that really, I've been so excited to see this for so long and I was a little bit nervous to see it because I'd heard so many people say that The Banshees of Inisherin is a bit of a minor film for Martin McDonough. It's not, it's not Three Billboards. It's not In Bruges. You know, seeing the trailer, I see that, but it also looks really fun. I don't think it looks like picture material, but maybe a screenplay. What do you think, Dill? I definitely see this being a actor showcase, which would also bring along the screenplay. And one thing that really stood out to me from this trailer was the score. I don't know if this is an original piece or something that was pre-done, but I really loved and was digging the score that was used in the trailer. And this was a movie earlier, like through the show, I was saying, I'm not that high on, but the more I hear about this, now that I see visuals, I'm getting higher and higher on it. Maybe not for a picture per se, because like Searchlight already has Empire of Light, but definitely possibly an actor to fill in for Leo or Domingo who fled the season or a supporting performance. Or a screenplay as well. It could get a little nice package of basically the two popes package that you talked about earlier, where it gets a screenplay, gets an actor, and almost gets in a second one as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I am not as sold on it for acting. I'm, I'm just expecting some fun writing, some, some great, you know, one-liners, and uh, a lot of dark humor. That's what I love out of Martin McDonough. So what I'm hearing is instead of being more like the Two Popes, this would be more like another Colin Farrell movie, The Lobster, where it's just a screenplay-only yeah. type movie. No, that's a, absolutely, that's a great comparison. I, I think this is screenplay-only, but I would love to see it get some acting, because Colin Farrell, Brendan Gleeson, both very overdue, and I would love to see them get some Oscar love. So speaking of something that is a little bit overdue, a movie we've been waiting on forever, and that we talked about here on the show as well, Blonde, Andrew Dominic, Ana de Armas, we had a second trailer, which gives a little bit of a wider scope of what this movie's about. And I keep telling myself, like, I need to hop off the Blonde train, this isn't happening. Ana de Armas doesn't have a chance in picture, the cinematography, no, the costumes, no, the, the score, no. But the more I see, the more I want to keep it around. Like, I initially did my August predictions a little bit early before I saw this trailer and had taken Blonde off for everything. But once I saw this trailer, I was like, okay, Anna, come back. Cinematography, come back. Costumes, come back in here. Y'all aren't in the top five, but y'all can sit around 10, around nine. I'm really excited for this one. I'm really excited too, but I, in contrary to you, I'm not putting it back on any predictions. I, uh, I think it's going to be great. I've heard that it's um, really, really something. The cinematography looks fantastic. Costumes look great. But I still maintain that I think controversy is going to kill this movie um, because people are going to go into it expecting a Marilyn Monroe biopic, and they're not going to get that. Um, and I think that applies not just to the public who's going to watch this on Netflix and be disgusted by what they see. It also applies to some voters who are going to go in expecting my week with Marilyn, and they're going to get Spencer times a thousand. I'm really interested to see for at least the film ball draft, where does Blonde go? Does it fare more like Spencer, which was an earlier type pick, or is this going to be a movie that everyone like you is kind of avoiding and it's going to last until like that seventh, eighth round where it's just like, we want to pick something that we know, but we really don't think mm -hmm. this really has a shot. Well, and that's the thing. If it lasts to the seventh round, eighth round, in that bottom five, it's a great pick because it has chance, but it's not one that you can count on. Um, so, you know, maybe that's like a good, a good contender for my number 10. 
But that said, I do think someone's going to pick it earlier. Um, this seems like something that someone's going to go, I'm going to take a chance on this in the second or third round, mm -hmm. um, which just feels like a really bad decision. But who knows? Maybe it'll really pan out. But overall, I'm not expecting big things for this movie in terms of awards prospects. Well, I know last year a lot of people were taking big swings on Last Night in Soho, and we saw how that turned out. But on the contrary, we have another movie that is taking a big swing with its direction, and that's Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, which I know that you're very high on. I'm extremely high on this. I, the more I see of it, the more I keep thinking, this could be it. This could be our fourth animated best picture movie. Uh, I, I really... I'm so in love with the style with the uh, atmosphere that he's created. And of course, the thing that stood out the most to me when watching the trailer is Alexandre Desplat's score. Uh, it's beautiful. But Dill, what do you think about Pinocchio at this point? Are you still predicting it after this trailer? I still have it as my number one for animation, and I don't have it in the five for any other category at the moment, but it's right outside for score. I just need to hear more scores, I guess. Because like, you don't, scores are a hard category to do before you actually like, hear the score in the use of a movie. And then, like, production design or in visual effects kind of following that Kubo strategy where it could get into some more categories. And I would love to see it in picture. And honestly, picture after you get, like, you have, like, a solid top, like, six, seven at the moment. And then after that, there's some movies I know I'm a little higher on than other people. But there's some gray space. I think there's, like, a solid, like, top 11 right now. And then, um... Pinocchio could easily come in if it has the Netflix backing and could become Netflix's number two and just yeah. slide its way into Best Picture because we know the Academy loves Del Toro. I mean, speaking of film ball, Nightmare Alley was my pick last year. I picked it number two overall. And until the last minute, this was looking like a horrible fumble of the number two overall pick. And luckily, the last minute, the Academy was like, you know what? We love Del Toro. So even if this movie isn't his best, we're going to still give it the nominations that it got. And another movie that could be embraced a lot or could just be ignored overall because we have two of these type of movies this year. And I can't remember the last time we even had one, but we have airplane movies this year. We had Top Gun and now we have Devotion, which to me looks really, really good. I'm a huge fan of Jonathan Majors and I'm really excited to see him get a leading role in a film. And I'm really interested to see how this film will play out because it has all like the boxes to be a possible Oscar player for multiple categories. But we already have a movie very similar to this in some ways with Top Gun Maverick. In fact, it even shares a, an actor. And it's just a film that I could see easily getting like three technical nominations or just being completely ignored. Totally. I mean, for me, I was getting some weird Oscar bait vibes from the trailer where I'm like, I don't know if this is going to be something or if this is just a contender for this had Oscar bait. Uh, this mm -hmm. had Oscar buzz, sorry. That's... The, what I was getting out of this. I don't know how I feel about it. I'm not predicting it for anything right now. And I don't even know where I'd draft this in film ball. I know it will be drafted. I just don't know what I would do with it. That said, I'm going to see it at TIFF. And I am super excited because I do like the look of the trailer. I'm just cautious. Speaking of another movie that is going to the Phil film festival series, we got Pearl, the prequel to X. And have you ever seen X? I know last time we talked, I... you hadn't seen it yet. <laughs> I still haven't seen it, no, but I'm going to watch it before TIFF because um, I love Midnight Madness. Midnight Madness is one of my favorite things about TIFF uh, is just going out to the, it used to be the Ryerson Theater at midnight uh, this year. It's not the Ryerson Theater anymore, but yeah, I just, I've always loved getting out there to, uh, to watch some crazy movies at midnight. And this year there's some ones that I'm really excited for. And actually Pearl is not the one I'm most excited for. Mostly because I haven't seen X yet, um, but they're playing the Weird Al movie there. That seems so fun. They're playing a Joker fan remix movie, which is wild, uh, which I'm super excited for as well. Uh, so, you know, I love Midnight Madness, and Pearl is definitely going to be a blast to watch. How do you feel about Pearl? Because you've seen X. So, X is a movie I'm a lot lower on than most people seem to be. A lot of people at the time when X came out said it was their favorite horror movie of the year. And it was not that for me, but the best part of X was Mia Goff. So if you're bringing her back, I'm kind of excited for this. And the trailer at least looks more slasher slash gore than X was, which I mean, I appreciate that part of X of its restrainedness at times. So I'm really excited to see what 
Ty West brings to this because I feel like it could either go over, like it, for me at least, would be a major jump up or it would be more of the same. But we talked about a few TIFF stuff, but some other festivals announced stuff this week. We had New York. So you want to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. This is actually really interesting this year because this always gives a little bit more of an idea of where things are being positioned. So we have been, we've had the announcements of the opening night film this week, as well as the centerpiece film of the New York Film Festival. Now, last year, the opening night film was The Tragedy of Macbeth, and this year it's White Noise, uh, which is interesting. And the thing that I find really interesting about this is it makes it clear that uh, Netflix has some faith in White Noise. Which I, I wasn't is, sure about. This is a film that we haven't really been super high on so far in the show so far. I'm still not very sold on it. I don't want to make the mistake I made last year with Tragedy Macbeth. Where I was like, okay, I don't really know how this will perform. And then it gets that festival premiere. I'm like, okay, this is for real. And then it ends up being not really much at all. So I don't want to make that same mistake two years in a row. White Noise is a movie I know I'm personally really excited for. But I don't want to let my personal excitement overshadow the the film ball and the Oscar uh, predicts for it. Yeah, I guess I feel the same way. I but this is making me feel like it's going to perform like Tragedy of Macbeth, uh, where it's not going to get into picture, but it might come close. Mm-hmm. It might get an acting nomination. It might get some like technicals. I'm thinking this gets screenplay. So this announcement has given me a little bit more faith in this movie, and I. Bumped it up. I've bumped it up a lot. So right now I have it as my number two Netflix movie. I've got uh, Bardo at number one, this at number two, and Pinocchio at number three for Netflix. So that is some big, interesting news. And the other one that I find even more interesting is the Centerpiece film. Now the Centerpiece film, this is one that almost always is a big contender. They use the Centerpiece as a platform at New York Film Festival to really push something that is you know, going to stand out. And this year, it's All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, which is a documentary film um, from Laura Poitras, the director of Citizen Four. Last year, it was Power of the Dog in this slot. So what does that mean? You know, for me, I think that All the Beauty and the Bloodshed could now be a documentary frontrunner that no one saw uh, coming. And especially if it lands a slot at TIFF, it could win the documentary award and get that nomination right away. That's very solid. To be honest, this was a movie I hadn't really heard about until you mentioned it here, and I just pulled up the IMDb. And yeah, I definitely fully uh, support your thing there. And I mean, the doc category is always a weird one because you feel like there's always a front runner, and that front runner isn't for real. And this year, yeah. who, there isn't that clear, distinct front runner at this moment like we've had in there's, years past with like Summer yeah, Soul and stuff like that. There's two front runners. Um, Right now, the two front runners in Doc would be Descendant, which is Netflix, but they haven't released it yet because they're waiting for TIFF. I'm 90% sure they're waiting for TIFF because uh, they want the award at TIFF. Mm-hmm. And the other one is Fire of Love, which we talked about last week. We love. It's great. You know, so I'd say those two are the uh, the ones to beat. But All the Beauty and the Bloodshed could totally act as a spoiler. And the interesting thing as well about the doc category is usually most of those movies are Sundance movies. So when you get something late in the game that kind of upsets everything, that's always very unexpected. So, But All the Beauty and the Bloodshed could totally be that. It could totally dethrone one of the Sundance movies. Well, speaking of something that we all were very unexpected for, was MGM's decision and Amazon's decision to move 13 Lives from super late prime Oscar season to come out two days ago on Amazon Prime because there was reports saying that this was like the best test screening in studio history. And this is a movie that uh, I don't really see where those test screens came from unless the test screen people were the actual cast. But it was still a pretty solid movie moving into our yeah. review segment this week. No, and I mean, for me, my, my theory on those test screenings is that this is a movie that I think if you're watching with a big group, I feel like it could hit you really hard, and then you'd forget about it like two days later. Mm-hmm. I guess what I'm feeling most of all with 13 Lives is that it's it's a good movie. It's a very solid movie. I, I think we both felt that this was a very solid movie, but I just struggle to see where the passion is going to be. I don't think that this is a movie that people are going to be talking about at the end of the year. 
The only thing I can see for this for awards buzz is going to be sound. I thought the sound work was incredible. But how often are we going to get a non quote quote blockbuster in for just sound when it when they have a lot of other and especially a year like this where there's a lot of blockbusters in the oscar scene are they going to pull 13 lives for just one category because i could see like a world where uh, this movie was a little bit different it could like get in for editing or could get in for visuals or something along those lines but i mean i still really enjoy this movie i think this is a very well crafted film i just feel like it left a lot to be desired and i haven't seen the rescue i know a lot of uh, talks about this film is just like it's good but it's not the rescue and they're like maybe people who haven't seen the rescue would love it and i'm someone who hasn't seen the rescue yet i still really like this like i would give this a very strong or a very like mid to low seven and i thought it was very good the two people i watched this with loved it they were floored by it so i guess to the quote quote oscar demographics because like my grandma loved it my mom loved it and they're both uh or like 65 and 40 respectively so more in that oscar friendly age so it could hit some specific voters but i don't know if it's wide enough and audacious enough to really captivate a big enough audience to really have a sum but i mean i would like to see this show up for especially sound and make the short list for some other stuff but i don't really mm-hmm. see it happening well i mean a sound nomination is completely possible just solo this gives me uh vibes of Deepwater horizon or lone survivor or those peter berg mark Wahlberg movies that you know always end up getting a sound nomination and nothing else that's what i feel from this um so you know there is precedent and very recent precedent for a movie getting sound and kind of nothing else i mean Deepwater horizon also got visual effects which was a big surprise but um, I, I wouldn't see 13 Lives getting that. I would, however, definitely see 13 Lives getting sound. So I've got it in my top five. I've got it. I bumped Nope out for um, 13 Lives. I'd prefer Nope in there personally, but I think 13 Lives is more realistic. That checks out. I would say the coolest thing about this movie has nothing to do with the movie itself. But my mom works for a company that actually helps supply the energy and power source for the divers going in and helping out so that was a cool little like tidbit of information for like outside of that's this very cool oh, it's a cool little draw in but like i don't know i i feel bad for ron howard and everyone involved with this movie just because of how like much praise the rescue got a year ago i felt like this was destined to not live up to that even though i haven't seen the rescue just the buzz around it was so high i was like i don't know how a movie version from ron howard is going to like eclipse that because no offense to Ron Howard, but a lot of people don't really like his movies. So I felt like there's a lot of like negative energy coming into this. And then you move the release date it's becoming a streaming movie now. So it just had a lot of factors working against it. And yeah, ultimately, I, I guess the interesting thing about Ron Howard doing this movie is that I actually think he might've landed this one better not as a better movie, it would have been a worse movie, but it might have been different from The Rescue if he had gone more with his typical style. Because the thing that's different with this movie from other Ron Howard movies is it's not very sentimental. Um, If you look at this besides something like Apollo 13, that's a movie that's very Hollywood. It's very sensationalized. It's very overly emotional and very dramatic. Um, and it feels like Oscar bait because, you know, you're try you got Ron Howard trying to pull at your heartstrings and trying to make this moment into this big thing. Um, and people love Apollo 13, but that said, you know, with 13 lives, I think he wanted to just let the story speak for itself because he, he it's not sentimental. He's not coming in there with a big Hollywood score. I, I think there was only like two or three moments in the movie that had music in the background. It was mostly silent. It was mostly a very clinical, cold approach to it, um, which would kind of let that story speak rather than speaking for it and saying like, oh, we're going to put the dramatic music sweep. We're going to have crying and, uh, and shouting and all of these things going on. He avoided that. Um, And it made the movie better for it, because the movie didn't need that. But maybe the Oscars would have loved it a little bit more if it did do that. I fully agree. And transitioning from 13 Lives to a movie that I know some people have given some Oscar buzz early on, and that's After Sun. I know you watched this a few weeks ago, so do you still have any lingering thoughts about it a few weeks later? 
I have a lot of thoughts on this movie. After Sun is one that it keeps growing in my mind. I like it more and more as I think about it. But since we are an Oscar show, uh, what I'm going to say right now is Indie Spirits, BAFTAs, and nothing more. Um, mm-hmm. That's how I feel about the movie. I know a lot of people were saying this could be a Best Picture contender. I know that some people out there saw it, loved it, really want it to be an Oscar contender. But that said, I really personally, I don't think that this can make the Oscars. I think it is too low key. Yeah, I I feel the same as you. I feel like I can definitely see the world where this could make a Best Picture run because of the reception it got out of Khan and how much like that was the buzz of the festival, even though like it didn't win the overall prize. That's the movie that most like people who went there were like, this is the movie you should see. But at the same time, it does have those all those issues that you mentioned where it's a very small film, it's very contained, it's very much not wanting your attention. But it can kind of get your attention. I'm someone who very much does not like watching movies on my computer, and this is when I did watch on my computer, so I feel like that really affected my viewing. So it's one, once it does come out theatrically, I will go back and try to see it to get a better a better viewing experience out of it. But I, I felt the same as you. Like It was one where like at first I was kind of muted and cold, but... The last two three days since I've seen, it, I'm like, okay, I I'm I'm coming more around or I'm warming more up because like initially I was like, like I was like a six, but now I'm up to like a seven. And I'm like, okay, I'm really excited for when this does come out to get another experience watching it. But another movie along those lines that I was kind of mixed on, but I haven't really grown since watching it is the Sea Beast from Netflix. This is one that some people have said could be an animation contender. I don't really see it. It has some very good, like, if you're nominating just for the visuals, I could see that. But the story itself wasn't very captivating. And, like, I know not all animated movies are supposed to, like, appeal to all demographics. But this is one that felt very much for kids and didn't really have much outside of it of any drawing connection. But, like, the animation in the water was very good because it's by the same filmmakers that did Moana, which had breathtaking uh, water animation. And I feel that carries over here as well. Just the overall story was not very captivating with it being netflix they already have some other stuff in their hands as we mentioned with pinocchio they have window and wild so they have higher priorities this year so this is one i could maybe see at the annies but i don't see anything else outside of that it's really interesting that we have netflix has so many animated contenders right now that we're writing off a movie from the directors of moana as just an also ran we're going like yeah. uh, uh, uh you know that's like their fifth best animated movie of the I know, year. It's crazy. Like how how good is Netflix at animation right now? It's nuts. And the fact they haven't won yet. But I mean we had a whole episode why they're gonna win this year. So they are. go turn into yeah. episode two. Yeah. But what absolutely. have you watched this week? Well I uh, I got to check out Nanny uh, from Amazon and Blumhouse. That was one that I um I had heard some mixed things about from Sundance. Now Sundance uh, at Sundance, this was a movie that won the top jury prize, the prize that last year Coda won, and the year before that Minari won, and before that it had been won by Beast of the Southern Wild, and uh, it had been won by Mineral and the Dying Girl, and of course Whiplash, the, the biggest film to ever win that prize. I think that the movie was very good. That said, the the thing that I didn't love about this movie was the horror. Now, Nanny is a horror movie. Of course, it's being distributed by Blumhouse, Um, And I think that as a horror movie, it's a total failure. I think one of my least favorite genres of horror is the horror movie where there's nothing scary going on the entire time. Um, It's just a drama and every once in a while, the main character will go (gasps) and there will be spooky music and they'll see things around. It's like the psychological drama where suddenly you're like, this will sell more if it's a horror movie. And then suddenly you just are like, okay, so we need some nightmares that just come out of nowhere and then disappear into nowhere. And to me, Nanny was like the epitome of that type of film. It was a movie where it did not need to be a horror movie. Oh my God, it did not need to be a horror movie. And it would have been like a nine out of 10 drama. So there's two different movies here, an extremely, extremely well done thriller um, that looks beautiful. It's one of the most assured directorial debuts I've seen in a long time. Um, and there's also a really bad horror movie here. So, and it balances out between those two. And it's just so unfortunate because this movie has so much going for it. And I cannot wait to see what this director does next. Well, with this movie being Blumhouse, does that mean it's going to be a theatrical release or is it being sent off to a streamer? 
Yeah, so uh, Blumhouse partnered with Amazon on this one. It's similar to, they did um, Welcome to Blumhouse last year where they announced, they released four films. That was through Amazon, and they're doing a similar thing with Nanny this year, except Amazon really wants to push Nanny for some awards. And is it going to get some awards? Totally, it's going to get some indie spirits. Keep it in your cards for that, because I really think that it has some potential for uh, some indie spirits points. Interesting, interesting, interesting. That's what I'm going to add to my list here to make sure. See, this is the, the fun part of the show that we're doing today. Yeah. We're bringing films that you may not already know about onto your draft docket. And so that way you can have the best draft that you can have. Exactly. And the other thing I will say about Nanny, since we're about to start talking about br- drafting, now there are some, you can get points from festival awards. And there are a few festival awards that count much more than others. And those awards are the Palm d'Or, the TIFF People's Choice Award, and the Sundance Grand Jury Prize, plus the Venice Golden Lion. Now those awards will net you 50 points. And since Nanny has already won the Sundance Grand Jury Prize, it already has 50 points. So that means, you know, it's automatically, you get that on your team, you automatically get those points. Is it going to be big outside of that? Maybe, maybe not. We're going to have to see. But you automatically get those points, which is why it's one that you should keep on your radar. Exactly. But with that all being said, I think it's time to dive into the Fancy Film Ball Playbook for the 2022 season to see how we can help you win your leagues and obviously the oscars are a big thing and they're going to help you rack up a lot of points because getting those oscar nominations are like the top like matt just said there's a lot of varying scales that he'll go into in a moment about how you can rack up points with those bigger award shows he can help you slew up those points and drafting films that you can get in like certain categories is a really big thing because yeah you want to get those best picture contenders but this year there's only gonna be 10 best picture nominees And like Matt said, 60 films will be drafted. So that means 50 films that won't get you the biggest prize, but can still get you points in a lot of other groups. And I know one thing from my experience is, especially once you hit like round four to round five, is finding those type of films that are going to be like locks in certain categories. Because like last year, I really eyed that actress category for Isa Tammy Faye and Parallel Mothers because I felt like they both had great avenues for not just one nomination in that actress category, but they had something coming along with it, whether it was hair and makeup or whether it was International Feature, which ended up not happening. But lucky enough, Score was a surprise nomination for Burr Hello Mothers last year. So both of those films had two Oscar nominations, and one of them even winning two. So that was a big pickup in the later rounds. And we have some years where the Best Picture nominees do go round one. But last year, Coda was a round three pick, and that was a major steal. So you can't always get the Best Picture nominees, but sometimes you can get them a little bit late. But one of my favorite things about Film Ball is trying to find the films that are the sleeper ones or the ones that can rack up a lot of nominations where you may not see. Obviously, last year, the big film was Dune, and that was a first-round pick because it got nominated almost everywhere it could have, obviously missing one category where, you know, no one really directed that film. So there's no need for a director nomination. No one directed that film that got amazing reviews high box office, a bunch of Oscar nominations, no one led that charge. But there's some films that can be a little lower that can still get a lot of technicals. We talked about it earlier, Top Gun Maverick, it may miss out on picture, but it's still going to get a lot of technical nominations this year. Avatar The Way of the Water could miss out on picture. A lot of technical prowess there. So those are films that you got to really gauge. Do you take your best picture locks like Babylon, which also could be like Mank and get a lot of nominations, but maybe not a lot of wins? Or do you go for more of those movies that are a lot for at least one or two wins come Oscar morning or Oscar night, I should say. And looking at it very early on, Matt, do you have any big thoughts about this year's season? Hopping into it here. Totally. Well, before that, I'm just going to break down a little bit of the points system here a little bit, because with these points, uh, it's very interesting. You can go a lot of different avenues. You can go right for all of the Oscar contenders, or you can spread it out. You can pick some things that might go well at BAFTA, might go well at the Golden Globes. So we have tiered award shows. So there's four tiers of award shows, and those different tiers get you different points, and you can kind of strategize around that. So of course, in our top tier, we just have the Oscars. Now with the Oscars, we also have tiered nominations. So the different types of nominations, and this kind of goes across the board of all of things, 
Um, best Picture is obviously going to get you the most points. You're going to get 100 points for a nomination for Best Picture. Now, for some of the Above the Line nominations, you're going to get 50 points for those. That's Director, Actor, Actress, Screenplay, Cinematography, and Editing. And then at 25 points, you're going to be getting the kind of below the line technical categories, including also Supporting Actor, Supporting Actress, as well as stuff like Score, Production Design, Costume Design, yada 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 and then at the very bottom you get 15 points for stuff like visual effects and song uh, now those two are the only ones that give you that small points value because really those are kind of smaller bits of the film so overall you can kind of pick based on that but then in our tier two for award shows, we have the BAFTA Awards, we have the Critics' Choice Awards, and we have the Golden Globes. Now those are going to be about half the points that you'd get at the Oscars. So instead of 100 points for Best Picture, you're going to get 50 points for Best Picture. You're going to get 25 points for Director, Screenplay, Actor, Actress, and you're going to get 15 points for the Supporting Categories and Technicals. So you can really pick based on those. If you think that something might not be an Oscar player, but it would play well at the Golden Globes, you're still going to rack up some points there. If you can get something, uh, for example, like a comedy musical, Matilda, for example, um, just off the top of my head, Matilda may not be big at the Oscars, but if it lands uh, a Golden Globe comedy musical nom, if it gets an acting uh, nomination at the Globes and a song nomination, Right there, you've got about 100 points for you. So you can really be strategic of how you want to build your team. And it's very important that you don't just build a team of things that you think could be at the Oscars. You want to spread it out. You want to get some good animated contenders. You want to get some good documentary contenders. You want to get some good international contenders so that you can build a team that not just is all vying for best picture, but is also pretty sure shots in different categories as well. And that's how you win. Exactly. And following that up, you really want to avoid the hype. You want to use your gut because, for instance, last year, House of Gucci seemed like a perfect no-brainer, top three, top four type pick. I mean, it had all the hype across the board. You had an actress contender, supporting actors, a director, a picture, song, everything. And then at the end of the day, Monday morning quarterback shows that this was really not the place to go because, I mean, Lady Gaga seemed locked in for actress. Obviously, she didn't. Costume seemed perfect for a win. That didn't happen. And Jared Leto, for his Mario impression, still didn't get in at the end of the day. But there's other films that seem like perfect, like Matt was saying, like round three, round four to be for the guilds. And this is one I fall victim to because last year I drafted Mass. I thought this would be perfect for a lot of those below the line type award shows when you give recognition to that ensemble, the writing, and even maybe some picture hype. And just nothing was there for that. So you really want to look at not just the film itself, but the, how people are talking about it. What person is distributing the film? Because like last year, Mass did not have a good distributor. And other films like Coda had a great distributor. And the distributor can go a long way because you don't need that huge package to win picture. Or you don't need that huge package to rack up points because Coda still ended up winning a lot of points last year. Solely when it getting picture nominations, supporting actor, screenplay, and some places with director. So a lot can go in to racking up points. It's not just trying to find those movies, like Matt said, that are going to be winning at the Oscars. Because like he said, getting those international pictures can do a whole lot. Because last year, Drive My Car was a ninth round pick. And that ended up being this that year's international player and racked up a ton of points. As we mentioned earlier, Sound of Metal was a waiver priority and ended up being a top 10 scorer for that year. Because it's not just the draft. You still have opportunities after the draft ends to pick up some amazing films for your team. You just got to keep an eye out for what has either the great distributor, has the buzz around it, or just has that perfect journey to get showing up in this category here, one there, and then at the end of the day, you can rack up points just getting a bunch of 15s and a bunch of 25s. That would equal just one big nomination at the Oscars. But I've rambled enough here. I want to hand over to Matt about how this whole drafting process works and how the waiver works as well. So for the drafting process, uh, the way that we do this is we separate leagues. So if you're in our Discord, you will have been separated into a league. Um, and with that league, you're each going to be assigned a place, a position in the draft. Now, we do this as a classic fantasy sports style snake draft. So we go from one 
to six and then back to one. So your first round pick, even if you if you get that first round slot, it might not be the best thing in the world still, because even though you get that first movie, you then have to wait 11 more films to get a second film, uh, which is a little unfortunate. So really, there's good spots all along the way. Um, you can, I, personally, I think that the best spots right there are third or fourth place, uh, because third and fourth place, you get to pick up films every, like, three or four films, you get another pick, uh, which is very nice, instead of, like, being at the first or second, uh, first or last place, where every, you, it takes 11 films for you to get back, then you pick two in a row, right? Um, so with that, we just go back and forth, we do that for 60 films, Films disappear fast, so you want to have a lot of possibilities. You want to have a lot of contenders. I personally have a list. I think I have 90 contenders on my list. After we've done that draft, you have your list of 10 films. You are allowed to trade those films to other people. That said, trading doesn't often happen because people like to stick with, with, with what they've got, but you can trade films. Uh, also, there is the potential to do, uh, and we've been doing this for the past few years, but obviously if you're building your own league, you do not have to do this. We recommend it though, our waiver picks, our late round picks. Now what we do is in uh, October, November, December, January, and February, we do another draft. And that draft, everyone gets one more film on their team. But enough about general strategies. We're going to get to some of the big films of the year, some of the ones that you should maybe be looking at, and some of the films that you should start to uh, think about avoiding. Exactly. And I think the best place to start with this is what we project the number one overall pick is. Because like if you play fantasy football or fantasy basketball, everyone always usually has a consensus number one. But I feel like with film ball, it's not always a consistent one. Most years, or some years there are, like last year, I feel like Power of the Dog was the consensus one. But in other years, like in 2020, there was a lot of choices. You had Nomadland, you had Mank, you had Trial of Chicago 7, which at this point all seemed like amazing first overall picks. Obviously, one performed a lot better than the other two. But I feel like in this year, we kind of have another situation where there's like three or four really good possible number one overall pick options. It's just which one do you think can turn out the best? So Matt, I think I know your pick here, but which one do you think is should be the number one for like most people's draft boards? So for me, I am the first overall draft. I did win last year, so I got that first round pick. Um, I will be picking um, Everything Everywhere All at Once. That's a film that I know I need on my team. I think it's gonna win Best Picture. I think it has a lot of potential to rack up points across the board. Uh, it's one that I love so much, um, but if you had to ask me what your number one pick should be, because again, the reason I'm picking that is because I know it's not going to last back to me, and I want to have that film. Um, but if I were to tell you the film that I think should be the number one, it would be Babylon. The reason for Babylon being uh, what I think should be the number one is it has such a high ceiling for points, because it's going to get uh, tons and tons of of Oscar nominations. It is poised to be the leader of nominations at the Oscars. And of those nominations, it has a high potential of winning a ton of techs. It could win things from uh, costume design to production design to score to cinematography to even director. Um, it has an incredibly high ceiling at the Oscars. And coupled with that, it also has a very high ceiling at other events. This is the type of thing that the BAFTAs go gaga over. This is the type of thing that the Critics' Choice Awards were, are going to fall head over heels for. Uh, the Golden Globes, it has the potential of winning tons of Golden Globes. So overall, I think that even though Everything Everywhere All at Once is my choice, Babylon is the one that I would recommend. I fully agree. I think that the consensus one is either Babylon or the Fablements, depending on how you're looking at it, because they both have the potential to be like a 2019 where we had two films rack up, where I think we had more than two films, get that 10 nomination plus slew. And I feel like that could be something that we see in 2022 with the Fablements and with Babylon. And maybe if things go a certain way, Avatar gets into that 10 as well. I would not encourage picking avatar very early because that is more of a, a wishful picking than a smart picking here and that's something that we talked about earlier you want to be smart with your early round picks because you don't want to waste your first round pick 
on something that's end up going to be a dud. You want to go as safe as possible early because you want to have that good ceiling or that good floor. Because yes, the ceiling could be higher for some of those other movies, but having a solid floor of I would say your first round pick at a minimum of like eight hundred should be the goal. Absolutely. You really want to land a Best Picture nominee in that first round because those Best Picture nominees, they go fast. There's only 10 of them and there's 60 slots and they go really fast. But that said, there's always Best Picture nominees that go in the third round, the fourth round. Uh, in, in my first year of playing, Roma and The Favorite were both, both third round picks. And last year, the uh, Coda went third or fourth round. So those are films that you know, you're going to have to keep an eye out for. I think last year I got Belfast third round too. You so did. you, yeah, you really want to look at the films. Um, again, I think you're totally right, Dill. First round, those are the ones that are sure things. Those are the ones that, uh, you know, this cannot go, uh, this can't fail. This has to get something. Um, and then when you start getting into third round, fourth round, that's when you start taking chances on, hmm, you know, this could be something. Maybe I have more faith in this than other people do. Exactly. Looking at last year's draft from our league, we had a little bit of a different league because we had seven teams instead of six. But six out of the first seven picks were Best Picture nominees, with the only one not getting in being House of Gucci at number four. And every Best Picture nominee besides Drive My Car was gone by pick 21. Yeah, that's that's how it goes. But drive my car. What a what a surprise and what a great late round pick. Exactly. Um, but let's let's get into some other ones. What are some other things that could be really really big? I mean, one thing that I would say uh, feels like a strong first round pick is Bardo. Mm hmm. I definitely agree. There, Bardo is in that collection of movies I mentioned earlier that I feel like are definitely battling for that number one pick because I feel like there's. Five solid options if you're picking first. While, yes, there's the smarter ones of Babylon or Fablements or everything ever all at once if you're feeling very confident about that movie. But I would also include Bardo and Women Talking to that solid top five. Women Talking would be at the, the, the further edge of the five, but I feel like there's definitely a route for that if you're looking at the possibilities of being the critic darling this year that racks up all of those critics groups. We've seen two years in a row now. The critics are almost unanimous with their with their love, with whether it was Nomadland or it was Power of the Dog. They all have been going for one movie, which allows for those movies to get up those super, super high totals. Maybe not all the way to a 2,000 for women talking, but could easily see itself to a 1,000 plus points next season. Let's get into those third and fourth round picks. What are some ones that we think are good uh, contenders that you could get midway through that might not be in demand enough to be first round? but maybe could come in clutch a little bit later. I think this one will vary lead to lead because there will be some leagues that people will overpick and there'll be some leagues where people may underpick because who knows, in some leagues, Top Gun Maverick could be a first round pick. In other leagues, it could be a third round pick. Those are, that's a movie I feel like there's a, very, there's a lot of variance for, especially a movie like Elvis as well, where some people could be very high, some people could be very low. And that's one that could have a super early pick where... I would, even though I'm a huge fan of Elvis's possibility, I wouldn't touch that uh, movie in the first two rounds. But once you get to round three, that's, I think, its sweet spot. But I feel like there will be some leagues where Elvis is a late second, early second type pick because people see actor win. That means a Best Picture nomination. That could also mean some text. But looking more at movies I personally see as good third round picks that should be available in most leagues. You already mentioned it once, but Pinocchio has the possibility to be what we all thought Soul would be and getting a lot of nominations outside of just animation. I think another movie in that realm that could be a huge player would be Triangle of Sadness. It has the screenplay possibility. It has an actor. It has director. That's and it already three. has 50 points from the Exactly, door. Exactly. And that's one that will continue to get recognition through the critics' bodies throughout the season. So it may not be getting those huge 100 points every week, but it's going to get a solid like 5 to 10 consistently throughout the season which will rack up at the end of the year another movie that i personally see as a possible good pick in this area which i mean it kind of pains me to say out loud because i don't want to encourage people to take it but it's i want to dance with somebody this to me seems like this year's T eyes of tammy Faye. just a movie that is going to hit those certain categories very hard is this going to be a huge player across the board no but this is a movie that I think will be an actress all season long. It will be in costumes all season long. It will be in hair and makeup all season long. And then with that package, 
maybe it has a chance to pop up in screenplay every year or so. And if you're going crazy, once you have all those nominations, a 10th slot in picture isn't that far out of the, the, the realm of possibility. Totally. That makes sense to me. I mean, something that I uh, would say would be a great, not first round pick, uh, but maybe a great second or third round pick. And I feel like you're going to agree with me here, Avatar. That's Mm -hmm. one that I don't think should go first round, but you're going to want to grab that really early because it has a huge ceiling there. And I feel the same way about Black Panther. Uh, Like you already said, I feel the same way about Pinocchio. Uh, But I would also say I feel that way about Tar as well. Tar is a film that I think has immense potential, um, and it could be that third round pick, like Belfast was last year, like Coda was, that ends up being something people are a little confident in, which ends up going all the way to the very end. So those are some ones that I think are really good third round picks. Now, a few that I think would be really good, you know, late game picks, fifth round onward that's stuff that i think uh like bros that would be a great pick at, around there or nope the batman uh those are some films that i would really recommend looking at down there now are some people going to pick things like nope or the batman in the first three rounds probably is that a mistake yeah because they don't have a huge ceiling but they have potential to rack up some nominations and maybe even overperform. So those are some films that I would recommend taking a look at later in the game, as well as some documentaries. Of course, we've talked a lot about uh, Fire of Love. That's one that you're going to want to snag as a documentary contender late game. I agree with that. But one thing with docs in the last few years is they've been going earlier and earlier. I think Summer of Soul, I have it pulled up here, I think was a third round pick last year. Um, it was bold. actually... It was a fifth round pick. It was a fifth round pick last year, and that turned out to be a huge score. I um, bit the bullet, and I took Flea in the third round last year, which did not pan out as well as I hoped. But at that moment last year, Flea seemed to be that doc that was unstoppable. As we know, that didn't come true. Summer of Soul came up and almost swept the whole season. And speaking of movies I've drafted. I, I've had an interesting track record of film ball because in 2020 I came in second and last year I think I came in fifth. So I've, I've been in the two scales of the upper echelon and the bottom tier. And I think one thing to really look at is movies that you should avoid because I've had a fair share of movies I've drafted that I should have avoided. Like Nass had all the signs to not take it and I still took it. And this year I think there's a few films that really stand out as ones that you should just not touch. I think 3,000 Years of Longing is one of them. While, yes, it has a shot for a few categories, this is one that's not going to be worth the points in the rounds that it will be going. Because it has the name of George Miller attached, Tilda Swinton, Idris Elba. People know about this. They're going to want to take it. I see this as being like a normal fifth, sixth type round pick. But this is one that I don't see really warranting the points that you could get from other films in those areas. Whether they are international, animated, docs, or other just lower tier Oscar Talibur movies. And another one, I know we had a discussion about this the other week, but it would be Armageddon Time. This is one I wouldn't touch until like the eighth, the seventh round. And I feel like this is going to be a fourth round pick in most drafts. One that I think uh, I would say don't touch this with a 10 foot pole until it's the seventh or eighth round would be Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. I think Amsterdam would be a great late round pick, but are some people going to pick it very early because it has the potential to be big? Yes. And that's one that's going to bite you in the ass really really fast so i my big avoid is amsterdam and of course i would also recommend avoiding um blonde exactly and there's some other movies that i don't think are must avoids but i feel it could be big bust and some of them may be a little bit controversial and some of them are just common ones like you already mentioned amsterdam is one i feel like could be good points but for the round that's going to go it's not going to work out because i could see amsterdam going as early as the third round but i don't think you should draft in the third round. The Woman King's another one where it has the possibility, but for where it's probably going to go, isn't really worth it. And another one, this is the one I think is the biggest controversial pick I have in my big bust list, and that is the tandem of Broker and Decision to Leave. I feel like one of these films will do well. At this moment, we don't know which one it is, and the other one is going to be a goose egg. It will have its critic score, and it will have maybe like one or two other additional points. So it will be right around like 100. And... The other one could be up to like four, five, six hundred. And you don't want to be the one who picks the wrong of the two. 
Yeah, I agree. That's that's a risky pick right there. And I think both of them are great later game picks, but I think both uh, Broker and Decision to Leave will get picked really early in most leagues because people are excited for those films. But excitement doesn't always translate to points in this game. You have to kind of detach yourself. Um, and similarly, you know, you want to detach yourself from your own feelings of, I don't want this to be big. Uh, because there are some films that have big potential, like The Greatest Beer Run Ever, which are pretty good fourth or fifth round picks that people aren't going to want to pick later uh, in the game. Like, they're not going to want to pick it because they don't want it to be big. Um, and then, again, another film that I think is going to go bust, which people might pick very early because of a specific pop star that's in the movie, My Policeman. I think that's one that people are vastly overestimating. I keep seeing in TIFF comment sections in uh, Twitter people being like, oh, My Policeman is my most anticipated of the festival. Don't bet on My Policeman. Please don't bet on My Policeman. That's a great late game pick because it could be big, but dear lord, leave this film alone in those first three rounds. You will be throwing a pick away. Well, similar to that, I think that Popstar's other movie for the year, Don't Worry Darling, is in that same boat where, yes, there are there are potential, but I feel like the bust is a lot higher than said potential for that movie because that's another one that I think will go even higher than My Policeman and... Honestly, they probably will get about the same amount of points at the end of the day. Yeah, now, the thing with Don't Worry Darling, I've clearly been very high on that movie in the past. I'm feeling less and less confident on it as the days go by. Now, this is still something that I feel like is a very strong fifth-round pick, but it's not one that I'm going to want to pick above that, uh, mostly because I know other people won't pick it. But my confidence drops on it every single week, especially after the nonsense with Warner Brothers this week, which we didn't even talk about in the news today, I realize. I but, realize that so as well. Warner Brothers has been doing some bullshit, and uh, that makes me really worried about Don't Worry Darling's success. I agree there. Don't Worry Darling is one that I agree with you. I would love it in like the five or six round, but I feel like this is going to be this year's last sign Soho that people just want to have, and they're going to take it in the second round which I think is really idiotic and dumb, but I'm, I'm always down to be proven wrong. I would love to see this movie perform well because it looks really cool, and I like it when cool movies get rewarded. But yes, Warner Brothers, they've done some stuff this week, and that makes me a little bit skeptical for Elvis going ahead. I know I've been a very big advocate for Elvis's awards uh, stance this whole podcast, and after what it seems their new business model is going to be, how much money are they really going to funnel out for award season because it could be the normal amount because they're like oh this is still a way to get viewers but everything else that seems that they're doing is like we are going to cut corners as much as possible to save money for bigger green profits and giving money to award season for a campaign that maybe will only result in two major wins at max may not be worth it to them so that'll be something we have to keep an eye out later in the season but speaking of awards and possibilities and elvis's possibilities in a specific category we're gonna start off with the actor this week with matt's predictions now i'm gonna count down from five and then give some other kind of ideas of where things could be so at number five right now i've got brendan fraser in the whale the reason I've got Brendan Fraser at number five right now is because there's going to be some controversy about this movie. I think his performance is going to be amazing. I think there's a chance that he picks up the Volpe Cup at, uh, Ven at the Venice Film Festival. I think this is going to be one of my favorite performances of the year, but there is an inescapable controversy coming up of um, fat phobia in this movie. So... I think that's one that the reason that that's teetering on the edge is purely because it is going to be controversial. I do think ultimately he'll prevail despite the controversy, but just be aware of the controversy. Then at number four, I've got Brad Pitt in Babylon. I'm still iffy about whether he's supporting or if he's lead. I do think that they're going to category fraud him into lead. Um, despite the fact that he is a supporting character. I think he's going to really define the movie. And because he just won a supporting category, what often happens is that after winning a supporting category, actors will be pushed into a lead category for a role that is not a lead because uh, the studio wants uh, 
they want them to get that prize now. So I think that Brad Pitt is my number four right here. That could change super fast once we know where Babylon's placing people. At number three, I've got Daniel Jimenez Cacho in Bardo. We still don't know a lot about this performance, but Bardo is such a strong film that I have to have him up here. And I don't have as much going against him as I do with Brad Pitt or Brendan Fraser, because one has controversy, one has a questionable placement. So Cacho is a solid lead, and that's why I have him as number three. Number two, I've got Austin Butler in Elvis. Could he win? Yes, especially as so many other A-listers are stepping out there saying his performance in Elvis is incredible. Um, that buzz could last to the end of the year and it could push him to a win, but we're gonna have to see a little bit more later. Because at number one, I've got Hugh Jackman in The Sun, which feels totally undeniable to me. This feels like something that, you know, he's gotta win for this. Um, Florian Zeller is such a great writer. He writes brilliant ca uh, characters with heartbreaking scenes and I think that his performance in the sun is almost a sure shot at least for a nomination and probably for a win especially now that it's confirmed Coleman Domingo is out of the race I know that was the biggest thing with this category in the last few weeks is just so many people are fleeing so what are you really doing to rack up the rest of the slots because we lost most people unanimous number two and a solid three slash four contender. But I really like your list. I have Pitt in supporting for my rankings, but if he was lead, he would be in my five as well, and we would have the same five, just in a slightly different order. Yeah, no, I have Brad Pitt in my supporting rankings too. I have him in both because I don't know where he's going to be. That said, I have him outside my five in best supporting actor and inside my five in best actor. Um, but some other ones that I think are possible here. Now, we've got Diego Calva in Babylon. That's a performance that is... Um, Maybe less exciting than what Brad Pitt's doing in the movie, but it's still possible. There's also Michael Ward in Empire of Light. I know he's still listed as supporting on Gold Derby. He is a lead in the movie. There's no chance he's supporting. Um, and it's very possible he gets in or he gets overlooked because he's so young. I've also got Bill Nighy, which I know you were saying Bill Nighy is a big uh, contender of yours. And uh, that's really what I think the, the scope of potential is. I'd love to see Ray Fiennes get in here, but I do think that he might end up being pushed and supporting for a better shot. Yeah, I have Ray Fiennes in my five for supporting after the fleeing of both uh, Killers and Rustin's possibilities. Because supporting is a category we talked about last week that really just got shaken up to a full and. And result, my lead actor did too. I have a lot of uh, a blue marks because like we make on our little charts blue for new entries. And out of the 10, I have four people that went up, one that stayed at number one, and everyone else is a new entry on the best actor list. And some other names that you hadn't mentioned that I feel like are in the conversation, maybe not in the five, but in there is Colin Farrell for the Banshees of Inisherin. Yes, this probably won't get in, but I feel like it's definitely in that 10 now after the fleeing of the people that we have had leave the season um, with Killers of the Flower Moon leaving. Apple has a new push. It's a guy by the name of Will Smith. So we'll see how that goes. I cannot see Will Smith getting nominated. I, they're going to try. They're trying so hard already. But I don't see it happening, though. Exactly. I have him at 10 just because they're trying. And at this moment, trying is over just people whose names are in movies for me. Um, and then some other names that stand out to me is th this one, this may be more of a wishful pick than a actual intelligent pick, but it's Kelvin Harrison Jr. and Chevalier. This is a film that I feel like could have an angle. He's an actor who I feel like is definitely on the rise and he needs that one breakout performance and in a category that just lost almost two for sure type nominations. There's some room. Will he get at the end of the day? I think this movie's probably too small, but I feel like he'll definitely pop up in some circles here and there. We're going to have to see, though, because I'm not convinced yet, but that could be a great, uh, since we're talking film ball, that could be a great, like, seventh or eighth round pick. Maybe that's my number 10 pick that ends up being, like, the two popes, or can you ever forgive me? Well, I can say confidently it will not last to the 10th round if I have anything to do about <laughs> it. <laughs> course now let's toss it over to the other category uh best actress what's your lineup looking like dill so i'll do the same thing that you did i'll start at five and count my way down so at number five currently i have olivia coleman for empire of light she seems to be unbeatable for a nomination every year every time she's tried since the favorite she's gotten in and she's i don't feel like this is a now. winning performance but i feel like this is one that's definitely going to be in the conversation if empire lights for real she's coming along with it 
The next person is someone I know I have a little lower than most people, but I just want to see how the movie plays out because the trailer was a little bit dark and could make some people feel a little empty, and that's Kate Blanchett and Tar. This is one I definitely feel like is in the conversation. I feel like she's probably going to get in, but I don't know if she's winning like a lot of people have it at this moment at least because I feel like the top three are just so strong at the moment. I have a Naomi Aki for I Want to Dance with Somebody at 3. The track record is there with the screenwriter. It has the prime release date. It has the history of musicians, a uh, musical biopic. And I don't know. This just feels like I just had that feeling about this movie that this is going to be something. This could also be, like what we were talking about earlier, a horrible pick for Film Ball. It could be a giant goose egg. But at the same time, this could be a very rewarding late round pick. And then you get to the top two of Michelle Yeoh and Margot Robbie. I have a very hard time at the moment figuring out who I want to have at two and who I want to have at one. Currently, I still have Robbie at one just because the narrative and the buzz has been building for her for years to win. But if everything ever all at once is the best picture player that you think it is, it only makes sense for Michelle Yeoh to win the award. Yes. And she also has a narrative. She has a narrative she of she's, she's never been nominated across so many brilliant performances she's beloved in hollywood but she's never really had her chance people feel she was totally snubbed for crouching tiger hidden dragon uh there was a huge campaign to get her in for crazy rich asians um this could be that you know and i think it's the rare situation where the narrative the overdue narrative is probably going to align with the one that people um also would say is like the underdog contender and then for my films that are not in, I have some interesting picks here, but I also have some more common, I guess, ones that would not be in the five. I have Carrie Mulligan as my first one out for She Said, just because she could be supporting, and I feel like this top five is too strong. So if she is lead, I don't see her getting in, but if she's supporting, I think she could maybe find her way into that lineup. Florence Pugh for Don't Worry Darling is one that was originally in my five, but the more we hear about this movie, the closer we get to its release date, whatever's going over Warner Brothers... I'm just dropping it slowly down. It's still going to stick around until I see it. But it's one that is, it's going down the further that we go along. And Till is the same way. While this is what I feel like very much could just be a, a Harriet 2.0 where it is an actress in like one other category and nothing else. At the same time, it could just be a, a zero. So I don't want to put in the five at this moment. And then that leaves me with my two more inspired picks out of my top 10 with Ana de Armas and Blonde. Like I said, I don't think she should be here, but I don't want to see her out of the top 10 just yet. And then I have Jennifer Lawrence for Causeway at my number 10, knocking out Viola Davis for my, my list. This is one that I don't really know how this will play. We've been waiting for this movie for a few years now. A24 is not even doing the distributing anymore. This will all be Apple. Apple has room to spend now. So if this is something, Apple has the money because they don't have killers anymore. And Emancipation, like we just said, probably isn't going to be anything because what can you do with Will Smith at the moment? And that just leaves him with Grace Beer Run Ever, which would have no category overlap here. So Apple can put all their focus into Jennifer Lawrence. But that actually matters if the movie is good or not because there's probably a reason why this movie's taken three years to come out. That's a really interesting lineup. I really like that you have. I'd totally forgotten about Jennifer Lawrence. Uh, I'm going to be honest. As much as I have, I have uh, Causeway like very low in my best picture lineup. I think I have it around like 35 to 40. I had forgotten about Jennifer Lawrence, so I like that you have her in there. Our top fives are the exact same though, so um, just a little bit different order. I do have, um, I think I have Kate Blanchett in third, and I have Naomi Aki in fifth. But otherwise, I totally agree with you. We're on the same page right here. Um, and yeah, I feel the same way with you. Florence Pugh, I'm getting big uh, oh, warning signals. You know, my, my engine light is flashing right there with that. I'm a little bit nervous about Florence Pugh and Don't Worry Darling because the whole film is just kind of going down the drain for me. Um, now, I do want to just mention something that I've heard recently. I heard some rumblings that Michelle Williams might be in lead actress for The Fablements. That would be a very interesting choice, I would think. But, I mean, if she's in lead, I don't know who I kick out because she would make the lineup, I'm pretty sure. I guess the Olivia Coleman train would have to end. But at the same time, I said that last year, and she still got in for a picture for a movie that wasn't even in picture. So it wouldn't make sense for her to miss for a movie that's in picture. But Kate Blanchett seems so strong at the moment. In my top three, I can't really budge. So I don't really know what I would do with that. I think that would be a very not smart decision for... Uh, 
Universal is distributing that, right? Yes. So Universal should keep her in supporting because supporting to me is an open category right now. I think if she could easily be someone who just runs the table in supporting. Yeah. If she is really a lead in the Fablemans, I advocate for category fraud there to get Michelle Williams her uh, Oscar. Yeah. Please category fraud her into supporting. She can win there. She cannot win here. Exactly. I feel like that too. And I guess we'll I guess we'll see shortly because I mean. Hopefully you get to see the Fable Men's in about a month, and you'll be able I to will, be like, yes. is she lead? Is she supporting? And then we'll be able to go from there. But going off of that, Fable Men's best picture. That's a lot of people's number one, but I know it's not yours. So do you want to give us a no, rundown of your ten? No, not. I will. I'm and as uh, as usual, I'm gonna go count down from ten uh, and kind of give some reasoning, and then I'll give some other ones just floating right on the outside. So at number ten, I've got Tar. Uh, now, Tar at my number 10, I've got a few reasons for this, and one of them is that Focus Features gets a movie in, like, basically every year. And what is Focus Features' contender this year? It's Tar or it's Armageddon Time, which means it's Tar. So I've got that in my number 10 slot, also because I think that people are going to, uh, I mean, we being early 20s people who are predicting this, a lot of the people viewing this are probably also in our demographic, uh, early 20s Oscar contenders. We don't know Todd Field. You know, we haven't been around for Todd Field stuff. We have not seen the power of how Todd Field has made two movies, both of which have gotten immense Oscar success. Uh, I think a lot of people are underestimating Todd Field because we haven't been around for him being an Oscar favorite. Now he's back, he will be an Oscar favorite again, and I think that it's going to become pretty undeniable after it premieres. I think that this is uh, pretty much a surefire win at Venice for something. It could be the Golden Lion, it could be director, it could be actress, um, but it's going to win something. And I really think that this is one that is going to go from being a uh, on-the-fence, on-the-periphery contender to being a big contender that no one can deny. So that's my number 10. Number 9, I've got Top Gun Maverick right here. Now, this is one that I'm still not very 100% confident in, but it has potential to win sound, it has potential to win uh, uh, editing, and it's very likely going to take a picture nomination with that as well. So that's one, you know, is its nomination hall going to be huge? No, but this could be Ford v. Ferrari. Number eight, I've got The Sun. Now, what I always say is if something's getting best actor, it has to get Best Picture as well. So if Hugh Jackman really is the front runner to win Best Actor, this needs to get a nomination here. Then number seven, I've got Empire of Light. Of course, we've talked enough about Searchlight. This is their big contender. It's getting in. Even more of a sure thing than Focus Features getting something in, Searchlight has to get something in. Number six, I've got Babylon. Uh, I kind of waver. I go between Babylon being like my number two and Babylon being my number six. And I think that there's such high expectations for Babylon that there's just a, a large chance of it underperforming just a little bit. I think it's going to be great, but I do think that some people are going to be shocked and appalled by its content. Uh, so at number five, I've got Women Talking. Now, this is one that could either be number two or number one, or it could be dropping off the list once it premieres. Uh, because it's a very talky film, uh, it's a very possibly cold film, it's a film that could be absolutely massive, or it could kind of falter and step and just uh, flop on the way to the Oscars. But I do think that this is a sure thing for a few acting nominations as well as screenplay nomination. And maybe some other things. I've got in for director too. Number four, I've got Bardo. This is Netflix's big thing. Plus, in the area too, he's pretty undeniable. Even if he's controversial, I feel like those that controversy will be stamped out very early on. And it's gonna lead to Bardo getting some very strong noms. At number three, I've got She Said. We're hearing great test screening reports for She Said. It sounds amazing, and it's a pretty uh, irresistible topic for the Academy. They're going to feel like this is a way to say, hey, look, everyone, we've changed. I feel like it's so strong for number three slot. Number two now, I've got the Fablemans. I think uh, my confidence keeps growing in the Fablemans, especially my confidence in the Fablemans keeps growing because I keep thinking about how are people gonna react to Spielberg? I mean, West Side Story could have been a top tier contender last year. Uh, it was so close to being one of those, you know, it, it, it could have 
came in very late and won. And I think that Spielberg making a movie about himself, the more and more I think about it, the more I'm like, oh, that is so irresistible to the Academy. They're going to see this as a way to reward him. And even though I don't think this will win Best Picture, I don't think it can win Best Picture, I think that he is a sure thing for a few wins. Um, and I do think he'll win director for this. And at number one, you already know it, I still have everything everywhere all at once at my number one slot. For reasons I've stated a billion times, it's going to be the big contender that is a darling through the entire year. And I think that uh, very late in the game, whatever is currently the front runner, people are going to get tired of and everything everywhere all at once will step in and take the prize. The Academy loves giving it to fresh voices. They love giving it to things that feel fresh, feel new, feel like they haven't seen this before. We've seen that for a few years now with Sean Hedder winning last year. Obviously, Kodo, not a very fresh movie, but it's still giving voices to like, it's a fresh voice. We're doing the, uh, the same old comedy, but through the lens of a new community, through uh, deaf or hard of hearing people. Uh, same with Nomadland or Parasite or even Green Book. All of these are fresh voices, and I think everything everywhere all at once is that fresh voice that's going to take the win this year. R10 is almost the same. Instead of Tar, I have Avatar. Instead of The Sun, because I have Austin <laughs> Butler winning actor, Instead of I have Tar, Elvis still there. Have Avatar. That's exactly. <laughs> exactly. It just works out like that. And the coolest thing I think about your lineup is you do hit all the quadrants. You hit you hit those big movies with Top Gun. You hit those more personal type stories, but you also have a just nice variety. You don't have any one studio really dominating the 10. You don't have any studio really missing. You got everyone in there. My biggest question is looking at stuff outside your 10. I see some movies on the rise, some movies on the low. The one that stands out to me most on the rise is White Noise. And the one that stands out most to me on the low is Elvis. Right, so for me, White Noise keeps jumping up higher and higher. And the reason for that is just honestly that first round, uh, not first round, that uh, opening night selection at New York. That feels like something, it has to mean a little something. Now, I do feel confident that this can get a screenplay nomination, but I don't feel confident yet that it's getting anything else. But still, I feel like it would be very ridiculous for me to discount this entirely and not have it kind of high up. You know, is it higher? I do have it at my 14 slot because I have uh, Black Panther at 13, Avatar at 12, and Triangle of Sadness at 11. But White Noise is really coming close. And Elvis, the reason that's dropping, I mean, despite the fact that Austin Butler is stronger and stronger by the day, um, the reason Elvis has dropped just a little bit is my number 15 slot is Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers is making some questionable decisions, and I don't know how Warner Brothers is going to keep campaigning through the season. Um, David Zaslav is making some awful choices, and could that tank Elvis entirely at the end of the season? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm shaky. I'm on shaky ground with Elvis, but it still would be ridiculous to have it any lower than 15. Well, I think... I agree. Elvis has dropped for me. It went from being 7 to 10. Um, so right now, that's my borderline movie at the moment, with my number 11 being The Sun. Just basically, who do I think is winning actor? That's who has that spot at the moment. I'm still on the Austin Butler train, but I definitely can see it being Hugh Jackman's time. He's overdue. People want him to win. Florian Zeller has the goodwill. I'm really looking forward to The Sun. I'm sure it's going to be great. I'm biased. What can I say? The coolest thing I think about your 10 that's out is how Pinocchio keeps rising. It's at 16 right now, and I'm sure by the time we talk about picture next time for you, it will be even higher. Probably. I mean, I'm just waiting for it to premiere or more information to come out about it, or more films to kind of flop, more films to come out and underperform. Well, speaking of films underperforming, after we finish up here, I'm going to see Bullet Train. The, the early buzz on the box office is not doing great, but the trailer looks so fun. I'm excited. It's Brad Pitt. You can never go wrong with some Brad Pitt. Dude, I'm so, I'm disappointed that that's underperforming because it looked like just a fun action movie that just had like a lot of energy and a lot of spectacle and for it to have like what, like a 48 on Metacritic is really sad because I just expected that to be fun and silly and you know, that's, I hope I still get that whenever I go and see it, but I, I don't know if I'm going to go see it in theaters anymore. 
Well, speaking of something else that I've heard is fun and silly, we got Bodies, Bodies, Bodies coming out in wide release next week, so I'm sure that we'll talk about that a little bit on the show. We'll talk about some more categories. Is there anything else that you want to dive into next week? No, not at the moment. I mean, we're going to be getting closer to our draft, so we're probably going to be doing a little bit more film ball updates for you guys next week. Exactly, but I want to thank everyone for tuning to this episode of Fantasy Film Ball. Definitely come back next week. we got a lot to talk about. But until then, my name's Dill. And my name's Matt, and this is Fantasy Film Ball. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Fantasy Film Ball with Matt and Dill. Keep up to date with us on Twitter at at @filmball. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you prefer to listen to podcasts. We even upload a video format of the podcast to YouTube if you want to see our faces. Thank you for listening to this episode of the show, and come back next week.